Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. In 1994, a group of European UFO researchers and authors convened at the Santo Espiritu del Monte Monastery in Valencia, Spain to discuss their alternative approach to the study of the UFO phenomenon. They aimed to officialize their intentions through a manifesto, similar to the Founding Fathers of the United States. Dubbed the Project Delphos Manifesto, the goal was to promote a single line of research focused on proving that many UFO sightings were of an interdimensional or paraphysical nature, contrary to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Spearheaded by Pierre de Laval of France's Commission de Etus Oranos, the group believed that non-human intelligences from another dimension or level of existence have been observing humanity for a long time. The project sought to uncover the evolution of these non-human intelligences on their retrospective dimensions and understand how they influence our physical reality. To achieve this, the group planned to open multiple fronts, including psychotronics and channeling, in the hopes of making the invisible visible. However, the use of traditional methods would not suffice. They needed to develop new technological devices to detect alterations in electromagnetic and thermal activity. The Ten Commandments of Project Delphos were such. 1. The UFO phenomenon is partially or wholly alien to the problem of extraterrestrial life to which it has been associated almost always. 2. Many manifestations of the UFO phenomenon enter the realm of the paraphysical, a level whose highly subjective nature can elude conventional scientific analysis. 3. Large networks of researchers in both America and Europe have managed to gather enough information to prove that many of the phenomena classified as UFO belong to the realm of the paraphysical. 4. There is a sufficiently abundant case history of phenomena that can be classified today as UFOs, and which constitute a proto-history of the phenomenon within the framework of ancient mythologies and the origin of religions which have become institutionalized in the present. 5. These manifestations are merely one of the multiple facets of a plane of existence or hidden universe, alien to our material world that is subject to the laws of space-time. 6. Their interference in human affairs must be inserted within the context of a real occult conspiracy, possibly aimed toward a new world order. 7. It can be concluded that the UFO phenomenon and other unexplained manifestations occur within the parameters of a vast plan of deception. 8. It can be concluded that this plot or conspiracy has interfered and continues to interfere with humanity's normal evolution and that of our psychic ability by means of trivializing the occult in a strategy essentially aimed at the young. 9. This course of action encompasses psychic manipulation, altered states of consciousness, personality modification, telepathic control, etc. And 10. The continued presence of the UFO phenomenon and its interference throughout history is proof positive of an intention and a strategy at the command of a force the line of action proposed by the members of Project Delphos seeks to counteract this subversive action, which takes place at both the physical and mental levels. The topic of interdimensionality and its connection to UFOs is a complex one, often dismissed by mainstream ufologists as fringe theories. However, some European researchers have sought to bring more attention to this area of study 
as an alternative to the traditional extraterrestrial hypothesis. Understanding the concept of dimensions is crucial to exploring the interdimensional theory. While the first three dimensions are easily comprehensible to us, higher dimensions are difficult to imagine. Carl Sagan attempted to illustrate the fourth dimension, which relates to time in a space-time continuum, using a tesseract or hypercube. However, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and higher dimensions remain beyond our current understanding. The interdimensional theory of UFOs suggests that these improbable points of origin are home to creatures that visit our reality. While this concept may seem far-fetched, the belief in another dimension or level of existence, known as heaven and hell, is widely accepted. Renowned researcher Dr. Greg Little has linked these places to the ultraviolet and infrared ends of the electromagnetic spectrum. Salvador Freixedo, a ufologist, prefers to speak of planes or levels as he finds dimensions confusing. He describes reality as a high-rise building, with each level or dimension being a floor. Occupants of different levels can only communicate through clearly defined paths, such as elevators and stairwells. Freixedo argues that places with heavy paranormal activity are where occupants of different levels coincide, and they could be other dimensional creatures. Freixedo suggests that we cannot guess what the nature of the errands of these creatures could be. He compares our role as eyewitnesses to UFO occupants engaged in strange maneuvers to that of a squirrel running along a telephone wire, unaware of its nature and purpose. The early sightings and encounters of the modern UFO era, such as the Kenneth Arnold sighting and the Roswell crash, suggested that the phenomenon was physical in nature. However, subsequent events raised doubts about the substantiality of UFOs. Ufologist Alan Hendry identified several alternate mechanisms to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, or ETH, that suggested a more paranormal nature to the phenomenon. These include reports of disappearing UFOs and ghostly humanoids, telepathic communication with UFO occupants, psychic experiences, levitation, walking through solid matter, and physical paralysis of witnesses. One example of a morphing UFO occurred in Tohunga, California on September 3, 1975. Witnesses saw a bright, circular object hovering over a helicopter. The object then changes shape multiple times before departing, with the helicopter following it. Similarly, in a Swedish case from 1959, a witness observed a glowing object with a transparent dome and occupants conducting repairs before disappearing like a ghost. Some UFOs also exhibit behavior associated with poltergeist phenomena. For instance, a witness in Salyer, California saw a hat-shaped UFO fly over the treetops, which resulted in house lights switching on and off, dead telephone lines, and pounding sounds against the home's walls and roof. In October 1973, Native American fishermen witnessed a discoidal object with rotating lights that changed into an airplane before flying away. This incident was reported in the Canadian UFO report. These events, among others, raise questions about the solidity of UFOs and suggest a more paranormal aspect to the phenomenon. In instances where unidentified flying objects, UFOs, have been reported, the beings associated with them often do not conform to typical human characteristics. In 1975, during a period of heightened UFO activity in Puerto Rico, an ambulance driver named Orlando Franceschi returned home to find something moving around in his backyard. His dog reacted violently and attempted to jump over the fence in fear. Thinking it might be children playing a prank, Franceschi armed himself with a shovel and went outside to investigate. There, he was confronted by a creature he later described as a zombie. The entity had long, pointed ears, a long nose, lipless mouth, grayish ashen skin, black spots for eyes, and a jawline resembling that of an ape. It approached Franceschi with a stiff, jerky gait. Not taking any chances, Franceschi struck the five-foot-tall intruder with the shovel, but the creature suffered no visible harm. It backed off after the first blow, and Franceschi struck it a second time, but again with no apparent effect. As he was about to deliver a third blow, he suddenly felt paralyzed and helpless. The zombie-like creature then vanished before his eyes. Although there was no UFO present during this encounter, 
It is significant because it demonstrates that the entity was solid enough to withstand two blows from a garden tool and yet insubstantial enough to disappear before Franceschi's eyes. Linda Moulton Howe, a renowned ufologist, gathered information indicating a potential conflict between non-human factions that may be interdimensional in nature. According to some of her sources, the Greys and Nordics have been at odds, leading the Nordics to seek refuge in other dimensions that are inaccessible to the Greys. This interdimensional aspect of the entities is well summarized by Dr. Gene Mundy, who stated in a 1989 article in UFO Universe that some creatures inhabit the physical dimensions we are familiar with, while others inhabit etheric realms, consisting of physical matter that is less dense, more malleable, and more durable than matter in the chemical universe. These realms have been recognized for millennia by the esoteric traditions of every major religion and school of thought as interpenetrating universes. Have you ever heard about the mysterious monoliths? If you're normal, probably not, unless you're a huge sci-fi film fan and just thought about 2001 A Space Odyssey when I mentioned the word monolith. Yeah, that big black rectangular thing the ape men found is a monolith. But like I said, that's sci-fi. But now they're becoming sci-non-fi. That is, science non-fiction, meaning real. These strange metal structures have been suddenly popping up all over the world the last few years, leaving people scratching their heads in confusion, like ape men in 2001 A Space Odyssey. From the deserts of Utah to the shores of Romania, these monoliths seem to appear out of nowhere, sparking curiosity and speculation among scientists, conspiracy theorists, and people like you and me who just like to learn about weird and unexplainable stuff. First things first, what exactly is a monolith? Well, a monolith, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, is a large, single, upright block of stone or metal, usually with a simple geometric shape. Think of it like a scale model of a skyscraper without windows. Monoliths, despite what we've been led to believe, have been around for centuries and have been used by ancient civilizations for various purposes, such as religious rituals, monuments, markers, and inspiring early man to pick up bones and start clubbing their friends. But what has been happening recently is certainly out of the ordinary. The mystery of the modern monoliths began in November of 2020 when a helicopter crew in Utah stumbled upon a shiny metal monolith while counting sheep. Most of us count sheep in bed when we can't get to sleep. These guys do it while in a helicopter, which I would think would not be the safest thing to do since counting sheep is supposed to make you sleepy. Anyway, this discovery quickly captured the world's attention, and before long, similar monoliths started appearing in other parts of the world, including California, which is no surprise, they're all kind of weird there anyway, Romania, and even as far as the Isle of Wight in England. So what the heck are these things? People have been coming up with all sorts of theories, of course. We humans do love to speculate. Some believe they are the work of extraterrestrial beings, left behind as a form of communication. These would be the same folks who think 2001 A Space Odyssey is a documentary. Others think they might be the work of pranksters, probably fans of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then there are those who speculate that it's all part of a marketing stunt or a social experiment. Marketing what, we don't know, which kind of defeats the purpose of creating a marketing campaign. Maybe a giant Jenga game is coming soon to a Toys R Us near you. That'd be cool. Despite the wild theories, though, the truth continues to elude us. Authorities have removed some of the structures. Party poopers. I'm guessing the military, so we couldn't get close to the monoliths and do our own investigations or start worshipping the aliens of Nibiru. Other monoliths vanished on their own without a trace just as quickly as they appeared. I'm guessing aliens, so we couldn't get close to the monoliths and keep ruining the giant game of falling dominoes they were planning. We can be so rude. In a few cases, individuals have come forward claiming responsibility for creating or installing the monoliths, but they couldn't possibly be responsible for all of the structures appearing, unless they truly are lizard people and nobody seems to understand what their motives or intentions might be anyway. Maybe they're like the two old guys who admitted to making so many crop circles in the UK a few years ago. They're just artists who are really good at geometry who have inspired others like them to do the same in copycat fashion. 
Honestly, that does sound like the most feasible explanation to me. But then I was never very good at math. Or art. Or conspiratorial thinking, so what do I know? Whether these monoliths are the work of aliens, artists, or giant board game manufacturers, one thing is for certain. They have captured the world's attention and will likely continue to puzzle us for years to come, especially if they keep appearing without the greys dropping off an instruction manual on how to use them. Personally, I kind of like the idea of not knowing. Like learning the secret to a magic trick, it ruins the fun of the illusion. I like a world full of surprises, wonder, and endless possibilities and mysteries. And the possibility that, right under our noses, the Nephilim are planning a monster game of Jenga. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. In light of recent claims by a former Secret Service agent, Landis, new questions are arising about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. The official findings of the Warren Commission, which concluded that Kennedy was killed by a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, are now being challenged. According to Landis, he believes the bullet he retrieved from the presidential limousine may have been undercharged and dislodged from a shallow wound in Kennedy's back falling back onto the limousine seat when the fatal shot struck his head. This theory suggests that the bullet, known as Evidence Item Q1, may not have been responsible for the injuries to Governor Connolly and raises doubts about the magic bullet theory. The magic bullet theory posits that one bullet struck both Kennedy and Connolly, but if Landis's claims are accurate, this theory may be incorrect. This opens the door to the possibility of multiple shooters, according to James Rovenalt, an attorney and historian working with Landis on a forthcoming book. Rovenalt points out that if the pristine bullet did not pass through both Kennedy and Connolly, it suggests that Connolly might have been hit by a separate bullet from a different direction. This challenges the timeline presented by the FBI, which suggested Oswald could not have fired two separate shots quickly enough to hit both men. The Zapruder film, which captured the assassination, shows a short interval between Kennedy and Connolly's reactions to being shot. Kennedy's autopsy indicated various bullet wounds, including one in his back, one in the front of his throat, and a massive exit wound in the right front of his skull. The bullet hole in his upper right back was traditionally seen as the entry point for a bullet that exited through his throat. However, if this bullet was undercharged and fell back onto the limousine seat, questions arise about the origin of the throat wound. Rubinald raises the possibility that the throat wound was an entry point and that the bullet might have fragmented on hitting Kennedy's spine. This new theory challenges the Warren Commission's conclusion that Oswald acted alone from the Texas School Book Depository. It suggests the possibility of multiple shooters, including the infamous Grassy Knoll area to the right of the motorcade route and the triple underpass in front of the motorcade, which offered elevated sniper positions. Robinault acknowledges that this article and Landis's upcoming book do not provide definitive answers, but rather raise important questions. Further analysis and forensic expertise will be needed to explore the possibility of a second shooter and reevaluate the events of that fateful day in Dallas in 1963.
a popular vlogger with the surname Lou who boasted over 2.5 million followers on a prominent short video sharing platform has issued a formal apology and settled a lawsuit with the victim surnamed Zhao. This reconciliation comes after Lou's actions caused considerable distress to Zhao, who had filed a lawsuit against him in June. The incident began when Lou trespassed into Zhao's residence without permission and proceeded to create a video that falsely depicted the house as haunted. The video rapidly gained traction, amassing millions of views and sparking a frenzy across various social media platforms. Deeply affected by the video, Zhao attempted to contact Lou and request the video's removal. However, Lou not only refused but also blocked Zhao from further communication. As a result, Zhao took legal action by filing a lawsuit against Lou with the People's Court of Zhenhuan County in Gaizhou Province. In a significant ruling, the court determined that Lou's video constituted a form of cyber violence, holding him accountable for the emotional distress it caused Zhao. Initially, Lou denied any wrongdoing, but he eventually acknowledged the harm inflicted upon Zhao and took the initiative to compose a formal apology letter. To make amends, Lu also offered a settlement of 3,000 yen to compensate Zhao for the distress she endured. Zhao graciously accepted the apology and the financial settlement, bringing the matter to a close. A Glitch in the Matrix Story from Glitter Fresh Gore on Reddit The most unhinged thing ever just happened to me and I honestly don't even know where to start. I'll try to start at the beginning. I am 41, female, I have a daughter that is 23. We don't live together, she's all grown up, but we try to get together every couple of weeks and spend time together. Tonight we went shoe shopping and decided to stop next door of the shoe place at Ruby Tuesdays for dinner. We were hungry. We didn't really want Ruby Tuesdays, but it was close to where we were shopping, and we were hungry, so we agreed we'd just go there and get a quick bite. We get our table, we're seated by a woman wearing a pink handkerchief in her hair. She takes our drink orders and brings our drinks. A few minutes later, she takes our food orders. Time starts going by. The place is hardly anyone there, and my kid and I are just catching up. I notice a table next to me. Three women appear to be maybe three generations of women – grandma, mom, adult daughter. While waiting for our meal, I notice their plates are empty, like totally empty. But they keep taking bites. There's no conversation. The youngest of the group is sitting very upright and smiling and nodding. The middle-aged one of the group says, we should just get this wrapped up to go. But there is nothing on their plates. I sort of gesture to my kid, are you seeing this? Beck is playing for music over the speakers, and I make a comment, Beck is sort of a weird choice for Ruby Tuesday. I quietly sing along. Dave Matthews' band plays next. Crash into me. My kid says, you know all of these songs. I reply, I'm a 90s kid. We laugh. An hour later, we still have no food. I'm wondering, do I want to be a Karen and ask when our food will come out? I politely flag a server and say, hey, I have to work really early tomorrow. Can I just pay for the drinks we had? Two Dr. Peppers. And can you cancel my order? It's been an hour and we have to get going. She says, yes, the woman in the pink handkerchief. She walks past me and I swear to God, I really do. She walked past me going in the same direction, not five seconds later, stops, says, your order should be out soon. I glance at my kid with that knowing look. My kid says quietly, I'm starting to feel really anxious. Can, can we just leave? I nod relieved it wasn't just me feeling weird. Dave Matthews' crash into me plays again. We're uncomfortable. Pink handkerchief server comes back around and says, the kitchen is backed up, please don't leave. I insist that we have to go. I pay, tip, and we leave. The whole vibe changed when we stepped outside. We spent the whole car ride asking, did you just see that? What the heck just happened? Everything felt bad. I'm not even hungry anymore, considering I didn't even eat. Everything was really weird. My kid noticed it, too.
In the year 1936, in the quaint town of La Piedad de Cabadas, Michoacán, a peculiar incident unfolded, witnessed by a young girl named Teresa. At the tender age of seven, Teresa found herself embroiled in an otherworldly encounter at the hotel where her family worked. What she experienced that day defied all logic and left an indelible mark on her memory. Despite her later move to the capital city and a life of rationality, Teresa's account of the mysterious figure and the coins that accompanied it remained vivid. In this retelling of the events, we delve into the captivating story that has intrigued many and left Teresa with a single, unexplained event in an otherwise ordinary life. In 1936, Teresa found herself stationed on the ground floor of the hotel where her parents and grandmother were employed. Her role was to collect money from visitors using the restrooms, a task that seemed mundane until the day she encountered something truly extraordinary. As she went about her duties, Teresa suddenly noticed a figure moving through the area. Clad in a flowing dress, the apparition appeared to be a woman, but it lacked any discernible arms, legs, or face. The ethereal garment resembling gauze floated down the hallway, leaving behind a trail of coins that emerged from its sleeve. Despite the surreal nature of the situation, young Teresa acted swiftly, collecting the coins and securing them in her apron pocket. Both she and the enigmatic figure then headed toward the horse stables near the hotel. However, when Teresa's grandmother realized where her granddaughter was headed, she promptly called her back. In that very moment, the mysterious escort vanished into thin air, leaving Teresa to rush back and recount the astonishing event. Struck by astonishment and fear, her grandmother, belonging to a deeply religious rural community, believed it to be a snare of the devil and resolved to take the money to Padre Bravo, the local priest. Seeking guidance and protection, Teresa's grandmother brought the money to Padre Bravo, who proceeded to bless it. At the woman's request, the priest kept a portion of the find, while the remainder, despite its perceived malevolence, was used to purchase a pair of sandals for Teresa. The blessings associated with Padre Bravo extended beyond this incident, as the locals attributed miraculous events to him even after his death. The priest's body remained remarkably uncorrupted for seven years until the coffin was eventually opened to relocate his remains. The inexplicable encounter that unfolded in 1936 at La Piedad de Cabadas left an indelible mark on young Teresa. Her detailed recollection of the floating figure and the trail of coins has captivated audiences over the years. Despite her lifelong rationality, Teresa maintains the authenticity of her experience, dismissing any notion of superstition and attributing it solely to her childhood memories. The story not only reveals the enduring nature of unexplained phenomena, but also offers a glimpse into the rich tapestry of supernatural folklore that has become an integral part of La Piedad de Cabada's culture. Have you ever heard of shrunken heads? You might think they're just stories from explorers about far-off tribes, plot devices from Gilligan's Island, or a scene from the horror comedy film Beetlejuice, but they're actually quite real. They might be small, but the practice of making shrunken heads has a big history, especially among the indigenous Javaro people of Peru and Ecuador. Imagine a time back in the 19th century when Europeans saw shrunken heads for the first time. They were no doubt horrified at the sight, but just like drinking black coffee, watching daytime television, or listening to NPR, they eventually acquired a taste for it. Like all human beings, morbid fascination took over, as did their desire to own something so macabre for themselves. Suddenly, they wanted to buy tiny human skulls to show off in museums or keep as souvenirs. Hey, look at my new lucky charm! It's a shrunken head! Well, it wasn't so lucky for the guy who lost his head, but look at the luck it has brought me! I now have a tiny human head on a keychain!" And thus began a new trade. The Javaroan people lived in the deep forests of the Amazon, which at the time did not have an Amazon.com distribution center, which would have come in handy for selling creepy trinkets to Europeans. 
The Javarowans were the original two heads are better than one proponents. They had the unique tradition of shrinking the heads of their enemies. Not in a psychiatrist's office by asking, how did you get along with your mother? Not that kind of head shrink, but literally diminishing the size of actual human heads. It wasn't just a gruesome hobby, either. It was a way to protect themselves from vengeful spirits. The Javaro believed that if they did not shrink the heads of their enemies, the spirits of those they killed would come back to haunt them. Honestly, though, if you killed me, cut off my head, and then shrunk it, wouldn't that just give me more incentive to come back and seek ghostly vengeance upon you? Well, yes, but the Javaro believed the shrunken heads, which they called Sansas, trapped the spirits inside. Like a gruesome form of a genie being corked in a bottle, perhaps. But don't expect to rub its cheeks and release a bikini-clad Barbara Eden eager to grant your every wish. You'd be releasing a raging lunatic who'd be so angry he'd lose his head. Because he lost his head. Aside from spiritual reasons, the Shavaro also made shrunken heads as a warning to other tribes not to mess with them. I'm sure it was effective. Imagine walking towards a village with tiny human heads being hung from poles and tree branches as you got nearer. You'd do everything in your power not to tick those people off. Even Vlad the Impaler would have thought, wow, seriously? That's just going too far, dudes. If human heads were unavailable, like maybe it was a slow hunting day or they had not yet renewed their beheading license for the season, they would use the heads of animals like sloths which kind of seems unsporting, doesn't it? How hard would it be to hunt down and kill a sloth? Striking down your enemies and shrinking their heads makes sense if you want to terrify people, but killing a sloth? That just makes you a lazy hunter. Now, go kill a hippopotamus and shrink that head, then you've got my respect. Seriously, hippos kill more people than sharks each year, and can you imagine that head on a keychain? Regardless of the species, though, creating a shrunken head was a meticulous process. It involved removing the skin from the skull, boiling it, and then shrinking it with hot stones and sand on the inside. The finished head was hung over a fire to harden, and the resulting soup was used in gravy and served on Mystery Meat Monday in Javaro High School cafeterias. I'm assuming. When Europeans discovered these shrunken heads, they became highly sought after. The Shavaro made it big business and traded them for goods like guns and knives. And what did getting guns and knives do for the Shavaro people? Yep, it made it easier to hunt down and collect more heads for shrinking. It was a win-win-lose for everybody. Ah, you gotta love that entrepreneurial spirit. Eventually, the trade in shrunken heads became so big that hunting your enemy's men wasn't enough, and the tribes began hunting women and children, too. Apparently, that finally got someone's attention in South America, and they started thinking, hey, you know, this killing people to cut off their heads to shrink and sell probably isn't a very nice thing to do. Somebody might get hurt. Maybe we should tell people to stop doing it. In the 1930s, buying shrunken heads was finally outlawed in South America. But still, there were many heads out there that were already sold, on the market, in museums, and in private collections, and were displayed as evidence of the primitive Amazon people. But in recent years, there has been a push to return these heads to their rightful place. To, to the Amazon, that is. It's doubtful the true rightful place, back on top of the shoulders of their beheaded victims, will ever become a reality. Not to mention they wouldn't fit anymore anyway. Today, the practice of making shrunken heads has largely disappeared, aside from artists who make fake ones just for the morbid buyers who want something so grotesque. But the legacy of the trade lives on in reality as well. Black market dealers still try to sell the genuine article. It's a constant reminder of a dark practice in history that even in our modern world is hard to get ahead of. Sorry. Couldn't resist. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com.
www.thinkandgrowthpodcast.com or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.